In the first part, we will introduce Action Track 5 of the GPML, which is entitled Access to All and addresses issues around environmental justice, digital transformation, transparency, and access to information. The second part of today's event marks the release of phase three of the GPML digital platform, uh, during which the latest developments and next steps will be showcased with a focus on aspects concerning digital transformation and access to information. I would now like to introduce Frederick Hogg from the International Maritime Organization, who serves as co-chair of the GPML steering committee alongside Sarah De Silva from the Government of Canada to give a brief overview of the GPML action tracks. Over to you, Frederick. Thank you, Ellie, and many thanks to all of you who have joined today's webinar. Um, I know that many of you know the GPML well and are members of the partnership, but for those who may not be familiar with it, the GPML is a voluntary multi-stakeholder partnership that brings together governments, the UN system, civil society, academia, and the private sector under the common goal of eliminating marine litter and plastic pollution. It was launched at the Rio Plus 20 conference in 2012 and has been continuously strengthened by various uh, UNEA resolutions since then. The GPML has continued to grow over the years and now counts um, 496 members from 92 countries, which is quite impressive. But we would like to reach the 500 member milestone before the upcoming uh, United Nations Environment Assembly, which, would, uh, which will take place at the end of this month in Nairobi. So if you represent an organization or government that has not yet joined our partnership, please visit our website. And I think uh, Marta will post it or someone will post it in the chat box and reach out to us. Next slide, please. So as part of, of its efforts to connect and inform all actors working to address marine litter and plastic pollution, the GPML has been developing a digital platform that compiles and crowdsources different resources, integrates data, and very importantly, connects stakeholders to strengthen collaboration on finding solutions to address marine litter and plastic pollution. And you will hear much more about the digital platform in the second part of this event, which features the release of its third phase. Next slide, please. The first part of this event will introduce the GPML Action Track 5, Access to All, which explores issues like environmental justice, transparency, access to information, and digital transformation. But to, to, to put this in context, I want to give you a quick overview of the five action tracks under which the GPML is currently organizing much of its work with the aim of advancing priority issues by connecting key stakeholders and facilitating collaboration and coordination. And as you can see on the slide, on the screen now, uh, the five action tracks are, first, action track one on the linkage between science and policy. And this aims to advance and update scientific and technical knowledge for combating marine litter and plastic pollution, to develop risk frameworks um, that can help identify priorities for mitigating economic, ecological, and social impacts, including human health from marine litter and plastic pollution. And uh, the third uh, focus of this action track is to bridge science, innovation, and policy to promote effective communication and understanding of the issues. The second action track focuses on action plans, uh, and it aims to support the development and implementation of national, regional, and sectoral action plans, identify hotspots, improve monitoring and governance, identify capacity building needs, and support project development. The third action track uh, focuses on development of guidelines, standards, and harmonization. And among other things, it aims to support data and metadata documentation, interoperability and effective use of data, engage the public and private sectors in the development of guidelines and standards uh, and uh, for, for products to enhance their sustainability. Action track four, focuses on sustainable innovative financing and aims to facilitate coordination of donor financing, address gaps and opportunities in current funding, 
promote plastic conscious banking, investment and insurance and develop a pipeline of investment projects. The fifth and final action track is the one we'll hear more about today and is focused on ac called access to all and as mentioned already it focuses on environmental justice, transparency and access to information, digital information, uh, digital transformation and innovation. The implementation of these action tracks is supported by various stakeholders, including GESAMP, the University of Wollongong in Australia, the University of Georgia in the United States, the IMO, UNEP, FAO, Grid Arendal, the Ocean Conservancy, and the Global Ghost Gear Initiative, members of the steering committee of the GPML, and a number of other experts. The action tracks are meant to operationalize key object objectives of the GPML, and the aim is to provide added value to ongoing global efforts by regularly connecting the key stakeholders to collaborate on ongoing and emerging topics of interest. So with that, and on behalf of the GPML Steering Committee, um, I would like to thank you again for joining us today and invite uh, all of you to engage in these efforts, which we hope will help keep the momentum growing towards bold actions to tackle the global crisis of marine litter and plastic pollution. Thank you so much and back to you, Ali. Thank you, Frederick. Uh, and thank you so much for this uh, orientation uh, to all of these important uh, resources. Um, so to kick off the first part of our event, uh, we are going to start with a brief poll to get your input. Um, so I think we'll put the poll slide up on the screen. Um, many of you have probably used Mentimeter before. That is the tool that we'll be using for the poll. Um, and so you should be seeing it very shortly here. Um, so the question is, how aware are you of the linkages uh, between environmental justice and plastic pollution. Now to respond to the poll, you go to menti.com. You can see it at the top of the screen, menti.com. And you'll put in the code 9619, uh, I believe that's 6217, there we go. Um, and you'll go ahead and put, the, uh, put your response in and then we'll get a chance to see real time um, how aware folks are of this connection. So go ahead and I know it takes just a moment to fill in your answer. Um, so it looks like this group is probably ahead of the curve uh, compared to many people in that there's a very strong awareness uh, in this group compared to, I imagine um, other groups maybe are not yet as, as clear or as aware of the linkages between environmental justice and plastic pollution. All right, um, feel free to continue putting in your responses um, and we can revisit this later if the numbers change dramatically. But um, thank you for sharing your uh, thoughts on this. And we are going to go next um, to a video message with some remarks from Marcos Orellana, the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and Toxics. And um, Marcos, take it away. Greetings, everyone. My name is Marcos Orellana. I am the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Toxics and Human Rights. I first wish to congratulate the UN Environment Programme for its ongoing leadership in regards to plastics. I am very pleased to join the dialogue on environmental justice, plastics, and marine litter. This dialogue comes at a very opportune time, as UNIA is only a couple of weeks away. Today, I wish to make three points which I believe are important in tackling the threat posed by plastics to human health and the environment. First is the need for a new international instrument on plastics. This is because of the transboundary dimensions of the plastics problem, the need for coordination of initiatives at all levels, the global, the regional, especially the national level, the fragmentation of existing responses, but also because of the global environmental justice dimensions of the plastics problem. I elaborate on these dimensions in my last report to the General Assembly that I presented 
last October 2021. In that report, I provide information on how the impacts of plastics on human rights can be seen in each of the stages of the plastic cycle, whether it's extraction of the fossil fuels that are used to make virgin plastics. How many times have we seen oil spills, um, the rupture of pipelines that affect indigenous peoples and deprive them from the right to health or the right to culture? It's also in the stage of production. The production of plastics generates outsized volumes of pollution, which have disproportionate impacts on fence line communities that live in the vicinity of plastics facilities. It's also the stage of use. For example, children are exposed disproportionately to plastics and are impacted by the myriad of endocrine disrupting chemicals contained in plastics. This has the impact of robbing children from their childhood, given the impacts on their hormone systems. And certainly waste mismanagement. I think we've all seen the photographs of mountains of plastics, beaches littered in plastics, the gyres floating in the sea of plastic wastes. In order to confront this global plastic tide, the UN Environmental Assembly in its uh, fifth session that's starting in a couple of weeks has the opportunity and indeed the responsibility to kick off the negotiations towards a new international instrument. A second point I wish to highlight is that the, uh, the scope of the new international instrument should address not only the issues of waste, it should address all stages of the plastic cycle. And that is because solving the marine litter problem requires a holistic approach that looks at every stage of the plastic cycle. This is a, an element of the circular economy, looking at consumption and production patterns. But it's also the recognition that the plastics problem is not just about the sea, it's also what happens on land and the rivers. And similarly, that the plastic problem is not just about waste management, it's also about the thousands of toxic chemicals that are added to plastics. So this is a matter of the scope of the new instrument. The third point that I wish to highlight is that a rights-based approach is critical to the effectiveness and legitimacy of a new instrument to uh, tackle plastics. And access to information is an inherent element of the rights-based approach. Information on the volumes of plastics production, information of the producers of plastics, information on the polymers that are produced, information on the chemicals that are added to plastics, information on impacts on local communities. This information is key for to enable effective public participation in plastics policy, in the design of effective recycling mechanisms, in uh, measuring and establishing uh, controls on to reduce plastics production. For example, information is also key to enable access to remedies for those who have been harmed by plastics. To conclude, uh, I elaborate further on these three points in the report uh, on plastics and human rights that I presented to the UN General Assembly. The bottom line is that the scientific evidence is overwhelming regarding the risks and impacts of plastics uh, on the marine environment, on human health, on uh, the planet as a whole. And thus a new instrument that tackles all stages of the plastic cycle and that incorporates a rice-based approach is indispensable to maintain a habitable planet. Thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you so much uh, for sharing that video, Carlos. And um, now we are getting started with our panel. So our first panelist that I'd like to introduce is Elisa Morgera, uh, Professor of Global Environmental Law and Director of the One Ocean Hub. Elisa, if you are ready, I will invite you to take it away. Thank you very much for this opportunity to share some of the work that the One Ocean Hub, which is a Global North, Global South research collaboration is um, currently undertaking with UNEP to really explore some of the key concepts that uh, Odeyan has just shared with us and very much uh, explore how important it is to engage with environmental justice as an inter and transdisciplinary research area for us to better understand how to apply a human rights based approach to marine litter and ocean um, and the plastic cycle more generally. Um, and so I have three points I wish to make very briefly today. Um, first is to show how an environmental justice lens helps us identify more clearly equity issues, both between the global north and the global south and within populations, which are the most affected groups and in what ways. Um, secondly, environmental justice is essential to identify critical knowledge gaps where we need more research to really have the appropriate evidence base to take decisions, address regulatory challenges uh, and take effective and appropriate action that will not lead to further injustices. Um, thirdly, environmental justice helps us to identify priorities for governance where in the existing international legal system, in inter existing international governance la landscape, we can take steps while we develop new instruments um, that are needed, as Oriana mentioned. And finally, environmental justice provides us that in essential contextual evidence base to prioritize the most vulnerable in the application of the human rights based approach in the context of environmental and ocean governance. Um, environmental justice is a term, an umbrella term, but it actually encompasses multiple dimensions of justice. And this is one crucial element of how it adds depth and understanding to our discussions. There's an element of distribution, who faces burdens and costs and who instead benefits from action or inaction. Uh, and we know that, for instance, marine litter waste uh, creates a lot of costs that actually cannot be bared in the global south, while, um, while the, the production, for instance, is mainly based in the global north and benefits, of course, accrue from that. Um, in terms of procedural justice, whose voices are heard or who has even access to decisions are taken and what are other um, practical impacts um, of this. And so, for instance, when we have adoption of single use um, plastic bans, whether or not persons with disabilities are heard in that decision and their understanding of the impacts of that decision on their rights uh, is included or not in decision making is an essential component of understanding uh, justice more broadly. Uh, the question of recognition, who is invisible and who is not heard in our decisions, whether, for instance, some um, um, uh, waste pickers, uh, their knowledge, their understanding of the issues, as well as the opportunities to improve, say, recycling, uh, would be one, one case in which we do not recognize their contributions, the value of their views, and, and can make uh, include those contributions in the decisions we make. Um, capabilities is also another dimension of justice and really understanding where there are, what are the conditions um, to pursue one's chosen path of life, whether the conditions are equal or not across different countries and communities to contribute to the issue of marine litter. And finally, restorative justice. So being careful about who we're placing the burden on to find responses. And while we want to include and listen and learn from human rights holders and particularly the most impacted from marine litter, we can't expect them to bear all the burden of finding solutions. And so restorative justice really speaks to the need to um, call upon and, and make accountable, hold accountable those that are provoking the issues. And so that speaks to our approach to say extended producer responsibility, but I think broader issues around business responsibility to respect human rights, from the extraction of plastics, for instance, and production onwards. Um, and as I said, keeping all these uh, dimensions in mind really help us to understand where we know enough about the problem, about the affected communities, about the barriers they face, uh, and where instead we need to know more. And for instance, one really important example for marine litter is that we still don't know enough about the effects of ocean plastics on deep sea ecosystems. 
and uh, what are the knock-on effects on the ecosystem services that those areas of the ocean provide uh, to us and which human rights holders will be most affected if those ecosystem services are deteriorated by marine plastic, for instance. Um, as I said, environmental justice also help us identify areas for action in the governance landscape. For instance, um, it shows where we need to take action under the Convention on Biological Diversity, thinking about how we can use the existing obligations on ecosystem restoration, for instance, also to address uh, human rights issues, uh, human right to health, for instance, or discriminatory impacts of ocean marine litter on particular groups, as well as developing, co-developing solutions. Equally in international water courses law, it really points the finger to the need to think about what's causing significant harm, who is responsible to preventing the harm and how we understand equitable and reasonable utilization of international water courses uh, when that water management contributes to uh, marine litter. And similarly, we have similar questions that may emerge in the context of the Paris Agreement, our efforts to mitigate climate change, which can potentially also limit um, extraction of materials leading to plastic production uh, and the negotiations at the UN on a new instrument on marine biodiversity of areas beyond national jurisdiction, where several elements could, if so conceived, address also the environmental justice issues related to marine litter. And so to conclude, the uh, environmental justice really helps us think more deeply about what the human rights uh, based approach means, how we can use the understanding to clearly think about the, the legally binding nature and the minimum content of conduct that is required in the context of existing international environmental agreements and under the law of the sea. Uh, to address those issues and focus efforts, uh, prioritize really actions that can benefit the most vulnerable among the human rights holders. Um, and on that, on that, I would like to lead to uh, sharing a video that some of my colleagues in the One Ocean Hub program have developed uh, to really understand how we need to bring together the evidence base, uh, both from the marine and the social sciences, and co-developing the evidence with the communities and the right holders um, to fully understand that there is no one understanding of justice issues. We need to understand the challenges in context, um, hear from the people that are affecting and making sure that any responses will not lead to consolidating or creating new injustices. So this video has been prepared by my colleagues at the University of Cape Coast in Ghana, Dr. Gina Uduru and Bola Erinosho, uh, working with a fishing community in the central region of Ghana who prefer to remain uh, anonymous. Thank you. I recall one of the communities we went to undertake our study, and it was overwhelming. Just seeing the ocean and then on the shore, we didn't really see any sand at all. It was all plastic that has taken over the place of the sand, and the canoes were sitting on these plastics. And we were asking ourselves, so who and who contributed to this? How is this affecting the folks or the indigenous? And they had different different stories to share. I don't know what the plastics and why it's beyond banana in there. I thought it was going to know. To be with a drink snippy. That's what I'm going to say. I'm going to say, I'm going to say, plastic now is going to be in. The plastic is going to be in. I'm going to say, I'm going to say, I'm going a rubbish damper was doing in years, but it didn't move. Pro was here. What could I do when it was going to be coming? And why be there? And said I didn't be a papa, it's from one year ago. It's from one year two, you should be an unknown, seen an unknown. And it's a bacana yama. And oh, you don't. Oh, you don't run a deba. And we're there drinks now, wab and water. And call there a cool moon we are. That's what. No, 
in the bed and who would my injury and find my dad because he'll call him. The injury and find my dad or they essentially do good pulling. No, with a mouth to my area name and turn to the mamma in my area. Sometimes they get the plastic and put it as a for two from over two. Thank you so much, Elisa, and thank you for sharing that video. That was really um, eye opening and, and fantastic to see, um, you know, and hear the voices from the local community. Um, next, I'm going to introduce a video that's been shared by. Um, Eddie uh, Manduantia, and um, Mehdi is the Undersecretary of the Pollution Control Division from the Ministry of Environment and Water in Malaysia. Uh, so let's see the video. Good day to all distinguished delegates, guests, and participants of the Global Partnership on Marine Dialogue on Environmental Justice. I'm honored to be part of this important dialogue where we can exchange views and learn from each other and further advocate for stronger actions to address environmental injustices caused by marine litter and plastic pollution. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, in Malaysia, the development of environmental laws dated way back to 1960s. Our Land Conservation Act, for example, was enacted in 1960. Our Environmental Quality Act was enacted in 1974 and our Solid Waste and Public Cleansing Management Act was enacted in 2007. Sound environmental law and policies as part of national management system are critical to support sustainable development. And aside from that, Malaysia is also a party to various multilateral environmental convention and agreements. This shows the strong commitment to safeguarding our environment. Well, in the context of global marine litter and plastic pollution, 11 million tons of plastic waste are entering the ocean every year. Plastic packaging contributes more than 35% to the global plastic waste. And out, out of this, less than 15% were recycled. This proves that waste management system at global level is inadequate and requires further improvement. And in the case of Malaysia, the potential market value for plastic waste is estimated at US dollar 1.3 billion. However, only US dollar 234 million were unlocked and potential material value loss is at US dollar 1.1 billion per year. And to ensure equal justice or rather environmental justice for all Malaysian, and also to complement the existing regulatory framework, Malaysia has introduced two key policy documents, namely Malaysia Plastic Sustainability Roadmap 2021-2030 and Malaysia Marine Litter Policy and Action Plan 2021 and 2030, with the objective of transforming the whole plastic value chain to a more sustainable pathway by adopting the circular economy practices. These documents outline strategies and guidance with specific targets and act as a true north for all level stakeholders and society to collectively take action in tackling marine litter and plastic pollution. Well, change should start from home by all of us. Separation at source will add value to plastic waste and thus contributes to higher quality recycling process. And of course, it will reduce burden to the current landfill. Ladies and gentlemen, what is clear is that success will only be achieved through a whole of nation approach. Each and every part of the society has part to play. And this is a journey that we are all in together. Thank you. Uh, we're so appreciative of uh, people taking the time to send these videos um, to share with this group. 
Um, our next video, um, and then we'll be back to live speakers, is Ellen Joukowsky. Um, Ellen is the Chief Sustainability Officer and Social Impact Officer for HP. Uh, let's hear from Ellen. I'm Ellen Joukowsky, the Chief Impact Officer and Head of Sustainable Impact at HP. HP's vision is to become the world's most sustainable and just technology company. And sustainable impact is at the heart of making that happen. People want to buy from brands they trust. And HP's founders, Bill Hewlett and Dave Packard, were intentional about building the values of sustainability and social impact into the DNA of our company. And when you align the needs of your business with the needs of the world, it drives value creation and it builds stronger companies. We know that customers are demanding more sustainable products. In fact, last year, HP's sustainable impact efforts were an influencing factor for more than $3.5 billion in new sales. And that's B with a billion. This shows that the impact of prioritizing sustainability and social impact, it can have on our business. And we encourage all companies to make it a core strategic decision for their company too. We also are encouraging prioritizing transparency and accountability. Our board, our senior leader, Leadership, management, as well as employees, they're all aligned to our sustainable impact vision and have clear strategies to drive progress. We've been producing a public sustainability report for more than 20 years now. And while disclosure may not always be comfortable, it's necessary, especially if we're to truly understand our impacts and identify where the opportunities exist for positive change. Our customers, our investors, and other stakeholders, they all tell us that they're using this information to compare companies and use it as a factor in their decision making. And again, that $3.5 billion confirms this. So now moving on to talk specifically about, about plastic. The estimated 8 million metric tons of plastic waste that flow into our oceans every year is projected to outpace the amount of fish in our oceans by 2050. This waste is destroying sea life and habitats, and it's threatening the lives and livelihoods of people all around the world, especially some of the most vulnerable populations. Stepping up to reverse climate change and the disproportionate impacts it has on communities of color, this is core to HP's climate action strategy. We've been actively reducing ocean-bound plastic in Haiti since 2016, when our company began partnering with the First Mile Coalition. Uh, we're collecting and converting ocean-bound plastic bottles in Haiti into recycled materials that were used originally in our HP ink cartridges and we continue to expand. Since then, we've diverted over 2.8 million pounds of plastic material. That's more than 102 million bottles from reaching the ocean. This ocean-bound plastic is combined with other plastics and repurposed into our products and our printing supplies. It includes things like the world's first display monitor that uses ocean-bound plastic, the world's first notebook with ocean-bound plastic, world's first mobile workstation, enterprise Chromebook, and consumer notebooks now containing recycled ocean-bound plastic. We've shipped more than 160 different products that include ocean-bound plastic now since 2019. And this program is creating economic opportunities for local residents in Haiti. It's not just about the environmental impact, which is incredibly important, but also the social impact that's possible through programs like this. By working with the local community on a holistic approach, we're helping address socioeconomic issues through jobs, education, and health and safety. And it's also attracting talent to our company. Our chief information officer, in fact, was attracted to join HP because of this project. We all have a role to play in combating the impacts of climate change and turning off the tap on ocean plastics is a critical piece of that equation. And at HP, we embrace this challenge as an opportunity to drive a net zero carbon, fully regenerative economy, reduce our overall environmental footprint and strengthen our business for the long term. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, and so now our uh, second live panelist um, and last panelist for this section is Kayla Williams. <clears throat> Kayla is the communications coordinator uh, for diversity, equity, and inclusion um, at Clean Production Action uh, at Biz NGO. Uh, Kayla, are you ready? Uh, and while you're turning your camera on, I'm going to remind everyone that we will have just a couple minutes for 
uh, questions for Kayla and Eliza. So if you have any questions, uh, please put them into the Q&A. So not the chat because there's too much going on there, but if you put them in the Q&A, uh, we'll make sure to give Kayla and Elisa a chance to answer your questions. Uh, Kayla, take it away. Thanks, Ellie. I'm here. Hopefully you can see me. So my name is Kayla Williams and I work at Clean Production Action or CPA, which is a US-based nonprofit where we work to design and deliver strategic solutions for safer chemicals, sustainable materials, and environmentally preferable products. Our organization recognizes that a marketplace that's dependent on toxic chemicals is rooted in systemic racism and injustice. For this reason, diversity, equity, and inclusion, or DEI, are core to our organization. We work closely with existing networks across the globe to develop new partnerships and learn about emerging technological trends and associated environmental health problems. We bring together stakeholders to develop and implement action agendas for safer chemicals and sustainable materials through one of our core engagement programs, BizNGO. Through this initiative, we released the Principles for Chemical Ingredient Disclosure in 2021, which exists as a framework for implementing chemical ingredient transparency across the value chain. The principles have been endorsed by 130 organizations, including 39 businesses, 29 investment firms, and 19 government organizations. We know that chemicals management and chemical ingredient transparency are environmental justice concerns because of the reality of the disproportionate impacts toxics exposures create across the value chain. It's more than creating products that are safer for consumers. It's about creating products that are safe for any living thing to interact with throughout its entire life cycle from extraction to disposal. Today, there are very few businesses who take this into consideration and explicitly address environmental justice impacts beyond the consumer and their chemicals management. So in 2021, we launched the BizNGO DEI and Environmental Justice Work Group that I've been sharing. We've started this year by inviting stakeholders, including investment firms, NGOs, and businesses who already have environmental justice engagements to share why this is a key concern for them and what they're doing now to build it into their strategic approach to their work. This is laying a foundation to build an action agenda organizations can use as a framework to incorporate an environmental justice approach into their chemicals management policies to protect more people and the planet. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kayla. Um, so now we have just a couple of minutes uh, for questions. So I'll invite Elisa to come back with us. And um, Elisa, we'll start with a question for you. Um, what more can be done to socialize concepts and build familiarity on the definition and impacts of environmental justice when it comes to marine litter and plastic pollution? We'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, thanks. No, it's a great question. And I think you also answered some of the question in the Q&A box. I think there's two things to be done at the same time. One is really supporting research on the ground uh, to really get the sense, the contextual sense of what environmental injustices are experienced uh, related to marine plastic and then feed that back into the international processes that can address some of the solutions and also provide guidance to governments. Um, and so in that sense, there is an element of directing maybe the funding, and there's quite a bit going into ocean plastics to really support the research and grassroots work and citizen science that can continue to provide the evidence base for us to understand what environmental justice is uh, in context in particular countries and, and be able to respond. Uh, and equally, I think for, you know, at the, at the level of UNEP and the global partnerships, making very clear links between what we understand of the environmental injustices related to marine litter and the obligations we have in different treaties, the opportunities for support we have in international frameworks, and really show that many answers can be provided already 
on the basis of our existing instruments if we make that connection uh, with what we understand the evidence of environmental injustices on the ground. Thank you. I really appreciate your comments there. And, um, and thank you for connecting to some of the comments in the Q&A. I see many of the comments in the Q&A are related to um, transparency and data and uh, transformation. And that's actually, we're gonna talk more about that in the second half of this uh, webinar. So we'll definitely answer those questions as we get into the second phase. Um, Kayla, I'm wondering if you can speak to, um, if you have thoughts on sort of the role of, of open data, uh, but also connecting with that, why investors are engaging in environmental justice work and how those two might be related. Yeah, so like I was saying before, chemical ingredient disclosure from businesses and corporations um, of just what they're using in their products, not just in the product formulation, but throughout the manufacturing life cycle is really important um, to empower consumers to make decisions that are going to be safe and healthy for them. And when you lead with best practices and chemicals management by not using toxic chemicals that are bad for people on the planet, you're going to inherently protect the most vulnerable populations. Um, and so the investors that we're interacting with right now already have a large focus on ESG investing or investing to promote um, environmental, social, and governance. Um, and they, some of them have relationships with communities on the ground. And these communities are asking for them to focus on environmental racism and environmental justice as a key concern and metric and where they decide to invest their money in these businesses. Um, so the onus is really on corporations to be fully open and transparent about what they're using um, to protect consumers and also to demonstrate to investors that environmental justice is a concern. It's a growing concern um, in the consumer population and um, in investment circles. Thank you so much, Kayla. Well, it's been a pleasure to have both of you with us. Um, do feel free to engage further in the chat um, or answer any of the questions in the Q&A. Um, unfortunately for now, we need to keep the program moving, but really glad to have these perspectives and this is really important uh, for this topic. So thank you very much. Um, all right, uh, now we're shifting into part two, uh, which is all about digital transformation and accessibility. Um, Environmental justice, including transparency and access to information, are both core aspects of the digital transformation journey that the GPML is leading. Uh, GPML powers a digital platform, um, a mostly open source, multi-stakeholder platform that compiles different resources, connects stakeholders, and integrates data to guide action towards the long-term elimination of marine litter and plastic pollution. The platform's innovative approach aims to align with the emerging digital ecosystem for people and planet, to support UNEP, uh, UNEP's digital transformation journey, and to become a digital public good for all stakeholders addressing marine litter and plastic pollution issues. Uh, to tell us more about this platform um, and how it is working to accomplish these things, uh, we have several folks from UNEP to share more about the GPML's digital platform phase three release. Uh, so I would like to introduce Heidi Savelli, the Program Management Officer uh, of, at UNEP, uh, Saiful Ridwan, Head of Enterprise Solutions, and Marta Otagali, Knowledge Management Consultant. Uh, so Heidi, Saiful, and Marta, um, please take it away. Thank you so much. And we'll walk through a little bit of what the digital platform is. And thank you everyone that has contributed towards this. When we start looking at this, and this is based on UNEA resolutions on requests across several years, calling for better integration of data, calling for promoting unified approaches to have work towards common frameworks to really implement and develop action plans and measure progress, as well as facilitating the coordination of action on an ad hoc or regular basis to co-develop solutions. So we have been working with a wide range of partners to develop the platform and it's done through a phased approach where in February 2021 we compiled a number of different resources and um, you'll hear more about the number that we have on the platform now which is very exciting. Uh, in September 2021 the second release or phase um, was implemented 
focusing very much on the data hub that my colleagues will go through more in, in details, and also testing the matchmaking functionalities that this platform aims to provide in the future. And now we're very happy to we'll be introducing phase three, that's then looking more at the data analysis, but also capacity building and how to ensure that best practices and case studies are shared across the world so everyone can benefit from lessons learned by multiple actors to highlight successes. And we're used taking a user-centered stakeholder needs and design process, where we're also using the input and feedback from stakeholders in shaping the platform. If we go to the next slide, please. The platform has three main areas. It's the knowledge exchange area, um, it's the data hub, and also the connect stakeholder aspect. We have achieved uh, some great progress, I think, to date, with the support of multiple partners and regional cities and others. And so far, we have more than 1,400 resources available through the platform on policies, on action plans, initiatives, and also financing opportunities. There are 247 data sets we're working with and coordinating with more than 40 partners that have been essential in get the, making the progress we have been able to make to date. There are more than 1,300 people in the network at the moment um, engaged in the platform, and we have also made available 52 action plans across the world. Supporting work includes work on indicators that UNEP has been asked to do as well, and also a glossary so that we're all speaking the same language and using the same type of identifiers for what we're trying to, to work on. Next slide, please. In regard to multi-stakeholder engagement, the, I mentioned the plus 40 partners. So that's a big area of just convening and coordinating on what are we all doing? It's such a big problem, so we need to come together and not duplicate any action. So you'll see a few of the partners here. We've also been piloting then how we connect different stakeholder groups so that everyone is aware of who is working, who is in the field, who has the knowledge, who has the expertise, who has resources, so that we can match needs with resources. And as a complementary aspect uh, to the digital platform itself, we're also uh, convening different multi-stakeholder forums so that's an opportunity for deep diving a bit more around discussions on specific topics, hearing where people stand on different, different issues and being able to have a dialogue around this. And this is also an additional thing that we're doing with the GPML action tracks, which Frederick mentioned in the beginning, where we're zooming in on some specific aspects and trying to co-develop considerations around uh, unnecessary plastics, for example. What does that mean? Can we agree on, on these things? And a number of other areas. So I think that's from my side, and I'll hand over to my colleague, Martha. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Heidi. And I'll just move uh, forward with uh, highlighting the Connect Stakeholders functionalities that have been just released now with this new uh, phase to help uh, stakeholders co-develop solutions, but also coordinate among one another. Starting with the ability to join the GPML, you'll see the screen button, which I invite everyone to click on. And by clicking on it, you'll see that we invite both individuals to sign up to the platform, but also entities to, to, to become members of the GPML. And also, uh, there is the option for everyone to see the upcoming events and to contribute to such events by submitting uh, the information. I'll go into uh, how to submit later. But I just wanted to highlight that we are building on a strong network of both individuals and organizations involved. And I welcome everyone to uh, create their own profiles to actually see uh, the others in the network. And lastly, we're also uh, supporting the creation of communities or practices to enable these collaborations to take place also in the digital setting the platform allows. So what's the advantage of uh, really becoming part of the platform is the ability to match with other individuals, or governments, organizations, to collaborate through the community of practices, but also to tap into the big network. And how you can do that is by joining, creating a profile, adding um, your uh, events, but also discovering who's in the community and becoming part of the community of practices. practices. Um, sorry. Moving on into the other challenge Heidi raised at the very beginning of the presentation is how do we address the need of integrating knowledge and data uh, to allow and support meaningful um, action. So uh, we started, and this has been a big focus that uh, uh, was presented before in the phased approach uh, slide, it, the capacity building and the best practice sharing um, 
has been the focus of phase two. So we had tried to build around all uh, knowledge products that were created to support the learning experience, including the MOOC, the uh, training trainers, and other initiatives that were uh, started uh, in the past, uh, a learning experience in the digital setting that the platform allows for that you see uh, a screenshot of. But in addition to that, we've also uh, started uh, highlighting 20 case studies as a sample and as a way to uh, come together and seeing what's in the platform in a, in a more uh, uh, summarized way. Um, in addition to that, the ability to tap into the broader library of resources that allows all uh, to actually see, and if you filter by, you'll see there are different categories. So we are including from action. Uh, so by clicking on this little button, you'll see there are uh, action plans, financing resources, initiatives, events, and more um, and more other uh, more types of resources uh, available. And here is just a screenshot of. Uh, the actual option that everyone has, being this a crowdsourced platform, to input and, and upload content. And of course, this will go through a validation process that we are in place of enhancing, uh, in the in phase of enhancing, and would also allow all the stakeholders to contribute directly to the resources I just showed. So the advantage is really about uh, the ability to learn through the platform, to obtain certification through the resources, and really counting uh, all the resources we have, the various type of resources is to leverage those by not just adding them, but also signing up and creating your profile to manage such resources and really help us eventually with the uh, super strengthening the validation process. So uh, the lack of coordination and lack of harmonizations are definitely front and center. And the way we have started um, also in this uh, digital setting, supporting both the action plan creation and, and measuring the progress of the action plans, but uh, the harmonization of, of data to support the implementation of action plans um, is being through uh, at first to the, the creation of communities of practices. Specifically, I'd like to highlight the community of practice on ontology, which focuses on streamline, I mean, uh, um, harmonizing the existing terminology and definitions around um, now utilized in this domain, but also the data harmonization practice, a uh, community of practice that allows various um, partners that, be, that have been sharing their data to harmonize their approaches and methodologies. So as a, as a first step towards a, a action an action decision and decision making uh, sort of set up in the platform where everyone can log in and uh, will be able to then access through a personalized view, whatever actions are prompted to them based on the information available. We have created this um, MVP, meaning a minimal viable product to showcase how action plans can be created, implemented, reported, and updated through the platform resources. And this is going to be very much linked to the national source inventories and indicators work that allows to really understand the key data available on uh, across the life cycle, life cycle. And I'll hand it over to uh, Saiful, who will uh, take you through both the data hub and the next steps. Yeah, uh, thank you, Marta. So good afternoon, everyone. So as Marta has mentioned, I will now take you on a journey to see in more detail of the third main component of the digital platform, which we call as the data hub. So as it as it is of today, uh, the data hub consists of uh, what we call as map layers. As you can guess from the name, it will it consists of uh, various maps and layers uh, that you can turn on and off so that you can focus on a particular issue in one go, or you, have, you can also um, switch on multiple layers at the same time if you want to do more analy analysis of the layers. Uh, next, please. Uh, after the maps and layers, we also have uh, dashboards analytics. So presenting these uh, data that we have managed to collect so far in the form of dashboard charts. And uh, one more importantly, in terms of analytics, for example, like trends, graphs, charts, and so on. Uh, next, please. The next item is the data catalog. As you can imagine, once we start to get lots and lots of data, a channel through the digital platform, we need to have a good mechanism to allow users, for example, to search particular types of data sets that uh, a particular user is interested in, similar to the concept of the, if you visit the library, for example, you do have a data catalog, and then you can search the book or publication that you want based on various criterias. And 
Fortunately, now it's all electronic, so you can type keywords or you can search by many criteria, geographical, uh, thematic, and so on. Uh, and then in addition to that, we also what we have called as a data set resources. These are essentially uh, inventories of data, for example, like technical resources, financial resources, um, action plans, uh, knowledge resources, and so on. And then uh, lastly, uh, we have what we call a story map. So the idea, the concept behind this is to be able then to present data in a more meaningful or contextual way. Because when you see graphs, for example, there is a trend, you know, it goes up or goes down, but uh, it will mean more if we also include narratives to those trends or, or decrease, the increase or decrease. And if you have pie charts, what does it mean 50% in a particular context? So the idea of story maps is to give uh, narratives to those data sets. The recording has stopped. Uh, to those data sets so that uh, become more meaningful. Uh, next slide, please. This meeting is being recorded. So these are three examples of uh, what we have already um, established or launched through the digital platform in collaboration with various partners. So the first one is the tracking marine litter with a global ocean model. So this uh, is already uh, online and is uh, interactive. So you can see the actual model uh, presented. And then we also have the leakage hotspot uh, models. And then uh, the third one is operational risk and warning system for microplastic litter. And we will continue to add more of these uh, data layers, uh, data layers uh, also in collaboration or partnership with various uh, uh, entities, organizations around the world. Uh, next, please. Now, what I'd like to highlight in the next slide is that, uh, you know, publishing data is one thing, but uh, there's another thing that we need to ensure is that what we publish are uh, validated or curated data. So we do have a validation or curation mechanism uh, implemented in the system to allow to ensure that what we present or push uh, or publish through the digital platform are uh, curated data. And if you, I don't would like, I'm not inviting you to see all the details of the, of the mechanism, but I do would like to highlight you to two points. One is that there is an internal validation mechanism, which is the GPML in your team member. But then there is also the external uh, validation because uh, we realize that, uh, you know, as you can imagine, we will not be able to validate or create the data ourselves. So we do this in partnership with external uh, entities, organizations. And so that is even, even more curated. Uh, thank you. So the, what is the advantage then of all this? Definitely full access to curated data. Again, uh, allow me to remind again, these are curated data, not just any data sets. Uh, across the life cycle and source of sis, from source to sea. Okay. Now, um, what would be, you know, the, the call here? The call is that, uh, you know, we see this as not a one-time platform to be launched and released, but there's an ongoing activity. We can never finish collecting data or presenting data. So the, the call or the request or the suggestion here or the involvement of everybody is to add your data sets, sign on, sign up, and share your data sets. Of course, uh, it has to go through a validation mechanism before it gets published. Join the communities of practice, which uh, Marta has presented earlier, help to validate our data as I mentioned earlier as well, suggest data partners in case we are not aware, and lastly, to join uh, training. Next, please. Now, those slides that I presented earlier are what we already have now. So what's uh, coming up in the future? So what we like to do is that once, you know, we really have satisfied and happy with all the data set that we have managed to collate and present, to try to introduce more uh, of the emerging uh, solutions that we have in hand in terms of technology. So what we call is AI experience, uh, artificial intelligence experience. Uh, Heidi at the beginning presented you with this uh, chart. So she has presented uh, phase one, two, and three. So I'm just going to very, very briefly to present what will happen in phase four and five and six. So in principle, like say, I mentioned in terms of technology, we'd like to use more of the emerging technologies, machine learning, AI, and so on. Um, advanced technologies, advanced analytics to allow us to um, address uh, issues like, for example, assessing the effectiveness of actions. Is it, is it timed? <laughs> um, 
actions by tracking and measuring progress. This is with the next release after the third release, which is now. The fourth release will be in September 2022, and then February 23, and then June 23, with all those objectives that we have. Next slide, please. Next slide. OK, uh, just to list down all the things that we have so far uh, listed that we would like to have in the next three releases. Uh, essentially, again, to try to make more meaningful, uh, uh, how do you say, give more data, making the data more meaningful to everyone yeah? by using the various uh, emerging technology tools, like I mentioned earlier. And these are some of the, uh, the list. Uh, if you can go to the next slide. And when I say uh, making data meaningful, uh, this is one example uh, that we are doing in partnership with an organization called TSC to understand and connect, coordinate stakeholder ecosystems through, again, an AI, artificial intelligence or machine learning uh, solutions. Next, please. Uh, lastly, when I say access to data, meaning really to try to access, uh, allow the data to be accessed to everyone. Uh, cater for all types of users and needs, accessible via via mobile versions, uh, various kinds of devices, tools, and more importantly, also to have light uh, light versions for uh, communities that uh, have still, how do you say, for example, uh, challenges in terms of connectivity, uh, and then for cater also, this is very important for impairments uh, community, either audio problem or visual and others. And of course, uh, as uh, always, we will have it in multiple languages. Uh, I think that is all on my side. Uh, I think this is handing back to Heidi. Thank you so much, Faipul and Martha. And I, yes, thank you so much. And I hope that this is giving you an idea of what of the plans are going forward and what's available already. I just wanted to take this opportunity on behalf of the whole team to thank all the partners that have been crucial in getting us as far as we have. And the, I think the collaboration for access to data layers, for information, for resources, this is what we need to continue with going forward. So any suggestions for partnerships, for ideas, uh, please be part of shaping this platform. It's not for UNEP, this platform, it's for everyone. And we want, we'd love for you to be involved in shaping how we go forward with the platform and make sure that it's as useful as possible for yourselves, your entities and any and um, others. So thank you so much on behalf of all of us and handing back over to Ellie. Um, I you. might mention just one thing. There was a question on in the chat. So I just mentioned that um, UNEP uh, through the Global Partnership for Marine Litter is supporting the development of action plans. We've been involved in the 16 regional action plans that are existing in different stages. We're working with more than eight countries in uh, supporting the development. And part of phase four is actually looking at consolidating, bringing together everyone working on action plans. So we start moving towards an approach that's flexible, but that it really takes on board the best possible areas that everyone is doing. It's all about working together, but trying to be as helpful for the ultimate user as possible that they're not confused by multiple approaches. So we look forward to continuing this work and we will continue supporting it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heidi. And there are there are a couple of additional questions in the Q&A right now um, about the platform, about data validation and curation, about using AI and things like that. So I would invite anyone from the UNEP team who has answers to those questions to go ahead and respond directly um, in the Q&A. Um, so at this point, we're going to hear um, from two users of GPML's digital platform just to share their experience and hope that can provide some inspiration uh, to everyone uh, to get more involved in using the platform. Um, the first person we're going to hear from is uh, Christos Yokomidis, the project manager and marine litter expert at the Mediterranean Action Plan Coordinating Unit. Uh, Christos, are you ready to share a little bit about your experience of using the uh, GPML data platform? Uh, thanks, Sally. I'm ready and I'm very happy to be with you and I hope that you can see and hear me loud and clear. Okay. So thank you for the invitation. My name is Chris Chakimidis. As you said, I'm representing UNEP MAP, uh, the Mediterranean Action Plan of the United Nations Environment Programme, uh, which is a regional cooperation platform established in 1975 and has been further transformed into a, a key governance um, um, mechanism for the Mediterranean. Uh, we have joined forces with GPML since I think day one and of course we have been very closely uh, focusing on uh, and uh, looking having an eye <clears throat> on the development for the digital platform where we consider it a big thing 
Uh, I mean, putting data into a single place in a clean and coordinated manner is a big thing. And uh, this is uh, something very impressive. Uh, from our end, we are also planning uh, to, 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 to also contribute to, to the platform with data coming from the Mediterranean. Uh, in, in, in general terms, I mean, the, uh, accessing data in a coordinated action and sharing information, it's very crucial. Uh, the data are the basis of what we do, and uh, we thank uh, GPML for putting all this uh, data into a single place, uh, which will help and guide uh, future uh, policies and assessment um, actions to be to be held in a very uh, <clears throat> in a very coordinated and very uh, secure manner. Because I mean, the, just having data is one thing, but putting things uh, and uh, having uh, clean data to, to, to work with is, is very crucial. Uh, the layering and um, and also the, the interface that the digital platform is uh, is offering is something very important because uh, databases and this kind of platforms are not always user friendly and uh, I would like to con congratulate the colleagues at GPML for uh, uh, moving forward in this regard. I mean the interface is really really good and uh, it provides also some uh, products already um, that could be become available uh, to the users um, and uh, definitely we through the platform we are also seeking in assessing the the, the Mediterranean action plan implementation and its efficacy uh, we're now in in discussion with GPML to 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 exchange on our reporting requirements and uh, on the way that we're collecting data to to assess the implementation of the action plan because at the end of the day we need to be uh, to to be sure that uh, our efforts and the the country's efforts and the community's efforts are are yielding results and uh, uh, particularly uh, for a liter free Mediterranean but also for the other seas as well so thank you very much and I do stand available for any additional uh, clarification or question. Thank you so much. Um, really appreciate your sharing that. Um, and I think we're also going to hear from Dr. Jenna Jambeck uh, from the University of Georgia. Jenna, are you uh, ready to share yep. some comments? Sure. Just Great. quickly here. Thanks, Ellie. Um, I recall like six years ago talking with Heidi and colleagues, you know, about a digital platform for people to access data, map data, download data. So I think it's really great to see this coming into practice today. There really hasn't been a good way for everyone around the world to use and um, see global data, especially equitably. Um, I'm a big supporter of open data as well. There's some conversations about that in the chat for all stakeholders and community members to access easily. Um, for example, with our debris tracker, which is now over 10 years old, um, the app itself is always free and open as well as the data. And we've worked really hard to improve ways to curate, look at the data, make it easy to download over the almost nearly five and a half million items that are in that database, we hope can contribute to the digital platform. So we want to participate in that way, along with other open data apps and models that are out there. Um, so I'm wondering if Dave can pull up our next question in the poll, um, which relates to this topic. Uh, I think Marta has to stop sharing. So we can, we can pull up that poll I, and I, a couple more comments. Historically, a lot of data has been hidden behind paywalls and special circumstances to request data, um, and we're still not there. Um, several parts of the plastics value chain, especially production and use, I think, and Kayla mentioned that at the top of the webinar as well. So I'm really excited to hear from the next panel, which is going to discuss the importance of an access to the digital platform. But let's see what you all think in terms of how this, you know, how you might interact with this digital platform um, here. So uh, we can see, gosh, it's about equal accessing data, sharing information. I know that's what I was, I was choosing here, um, but also finding resources as well. So, I mean, we're actually pretty equal across all of these. It's going to be a very useful platform for everyone. So let's, let's hear from the panel. Thanks, Ellie. Thank you so much, Jenna. Uh, and thanks to everyone for sharing your input on the polls. Um, and they're not going to close. So if you want to still go in and add your um, comments, please do, or your responses. Uh, and but we'll take the poll down for now, and then we'll uh, we'll be able to share those results out later. 
Um, so now we are uh, going to welcome the second panel of this uh, webinar. Um, <clears throat> this panel is addressing how we can create a platform accessible to all, supporting decision-making and stakeholder coordination. Um, again, we will welcome your questions in the Q&A, um, and we are looking forward to welcoming our five panelists. Uh, so our panelists are uh, Lisbeth Rhiannon Hansen, um, from <clears throat> she's a program advisor at UNEP DHI Center, Carrie Tamora, Global Head of Product, the Stakeholder Company. Um, Dr. Max Liberon, Associate Professor of Geography and Director of CLEAR at Memorial University in Canada. Chris Corbin, who's a Program Officer at Cartagena Convention Secretariat. Um, and Sadomitsu Sekoguchi, um, the Office of Policies Against Marine Plastic Pollution at Japan's Ministry of the Environment. Um, so we will start with Lisbeth. Um, and I would invite panelists, you may all turn your videos on at this point. This is going to be somewhat of a conversation, as much as we can do over Zoom in a panel format. Uh, so, Elizabeth, I'm going to start with you. Um, can you please speak to the role of data harmonization in making progress against uh, marine litter and plastic pollution? Yes, thank you very much, Ellie. I hope you can hear me and see me. Um, so data harmonization is an important exercise that we are now uh, tackling uh, through the GPML platform because it can support the creation of national source inventories. And the way that it can do that, it's to ensure that countries can identify and access readily available and relevant data um, that is actually validated by the expert community that we've been discussing today and who are in this call and, and contributing to the GPML data platform. Uh, we know that there's a lot of data out there, so data harmonization is important to make sure that the data is accessible, um, but also in a way so that we can agree on standards for data collection uh, to ensure compatibility across different countries. Um, so data harmonization will support countries to make their decisions and develop action plans which are actually based on science. Uh, it will help countries to measure the impacts of marine plastic litter on the environment but also it's going to enable them to, to monitor the progress of the action plans that they're developing. So ultimately data harmonization will help countries to also combine the own, their own data that they're developing with available global and regional data sets, um, which will strengthen data for monitoring activities. Thank you, that's really helpful. And uh, it sounds like it should work very well. So that's fantastic. Um, next, I'd like to um, ask Carrie to um, speak to a bit more about, you know, from in your experience, how digital platforms can enable collaboration and, and what allows that to happen um, best? What are the conditions that uh, best facilitate collaboration through digital platforms? Carrie? Thank you, Ellie. Um, so many of our clients uh, across sectors, they face this common challenge in the lack of understanding their stakeholders at scale. Right, they're typically limited to their own networks. So this makes it harder for them to reach uh, their sustainability impact. Um, and this is just partner to partner. Now to form a collective or a coalition and managing multi-stakeholder partnerships, that becomes exponentially challenging. And especially when you're trying to align on a shared agenda, operationally and strategically on, on complex campaigns, which require coordination you know, across multiple issues, geographies, and, and functions. So digital platforms help to enable organizations to address those issues that I just talked about, right? By, by crowdsourcing and aggregating stakeholder information, papers, activities, and related resources, and using AI or NLP to process this at scale. Um, so then users are able to digitally map um, and visualize your overall stakeholder ecosystems which help you understand the big picture of the issue, prioritize the stakeholders, uh, and analyze their strengths or influence towards the sustainability goals. And this way, uh, you can find synergies between your organization initiatives, um, identifying the right channels of collaboration, which you would otherwise do uh, in a manual linear path. So the members of the GPML can essentially access uh, this growing knowledge database on the digital platform. Um, discover like-minded peers or initiatives which plug gaps in needed ex you know, expertise or capabilities, or contribute or collaborate to existing work streams and ultimately connect with them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carrie. Um, apologies for my dog. Um, Dr. Liberon, I'm going to come to you next. Um, could you please speak to the challenges faced by Indigenous communities uh, in doing this work? Uh, sure. 
So, um, first of all, it's really important to acknowledge that there is immense diversity of Indigenous peoples uh, worldwide. So there's no such thing as like Indigenous peoples as a universal category. And so any alignment with any Indigenous group has to be specific to that group because we don't all agree. Uh, and there's no universal statements, including the next two I'm going to make. Uh, so the second thing that I've noticed a lot as both an Indigenous person and a scientist is that Indigenous community research priorities and questions do not always and actually very rarely align with scientific community priorities. So for example, um, in harmonization efforts, um, choosing animals that are the most important to the scientific community as you know, environmental indicators for ingesting plastics aren't the animals we eat. Um, they aren't getting sampled when we catch them or fish them and, you know, in places where we eat and catch them. So even if the data is there, it's not actually useful to our research priorities, Indigenous research priorities and questions. And then finally, especially on the topic of openness, is there's sometimes or often, but not doesn't have to be a clash between Indigenous data sovereignty and openness. So Indigenous data sovereignty is an international movement to ensure that um, we have control and possession of data about our indigenous lands, foods, health, and they're not just accessible to anyone on not our terms. Um, and so open data does often happen off indigenous lands with when it's um, by consent of indigenous nations and groups. Um, but there are lots of uh, instances where those things are being open without our consent. And so that has to be addressed uh, in these sorts of uh, platforms. So thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, really helpful to hear that uh, that perspective. Um, next, I'm going to go to Chris. Um, Chris, I understand the Cartagena Convention Secretariat and the Caribbean Regional Seas Program have made enormous progress in developing a regional action plan. What can you share with us about how this has been possible and what has enabled this success? Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Good, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. We developed our Regional Marine Litter Action Plan in 2014. And last year, 28 countries of our region endorsed the new Regional Marine Litter Strategy. Uh, one of the key frameworks was a regional node, which was facilitated through the Global Partnership on Marine Litter. And we co-host that node with the Gulf and Caribbean Fisheries Institute. And this has coordinated work on marine litter and plastics in our region and contributed to our own contracting parties identifying marine litter and plastics as one of the priority pollutants for action. But lack of data remained a challenge. And I believe that the GPL digital platform contributes to that gap, contributes to the need for data and to enhance partnerships. Uh, one practical example is the matchmaking and the collaboration which we now have with the Florida State University to map the sources, movement, and impacts of plastics and microplastics in the Caribbean. Our future work as we move forward will be to focus on policy, research, education, and awareness, but even more importantly, on the ground solutions involving local communities while achieving our mission. Uh, we really want to congratulate the entire team. The digital platform we believe is very well placed to continue to facilitate the sharing of best practices, the networking, the resource mobilization and providing the critical data, we need to make that happen. So we look forward to continuing to, to work with it and to continue to strengthen our own work at the regional level. Thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna introduce our, our final panelists now, but I wanna remind folks, we do have some time for Q&A. So if you have questions, please go ahead and put them into the Q&A box um, and we will have the panelists uh, speak to them. Um, so uh, last, but certainly not least, um, is Sadamitsu Sekoguchi. Uh, Seko, how do you see your work on data feeding into and strengthening the digital platform? Can you speak to that for us, please? Sure. Well, uh, thank you, Eli. Um, well, measures against marine plastic pollution have currently been widely discussed towards UNIF 5.2, and accumulation of scientific knowledge and the sharing of data globally are essential measures. Um, in that sense, the importance of the role that GPML digital platform plays will be furthered. Um, Japan has been working on uh, monitoring harmonization and international data sharing for ocean surface microplastics since 2016. A key outcome of this work was the publishing of 
guidelines on the harmonization of sampling and analytical methods. As a next step, Japan is developing a database, compiling and visualizing uh, monitoring data of ocean surface microplastic around the world. We expect the database to be launched in 2023. Uh, we believe the uh, GPML digital platform, um, along with our database, will jointly serve, serve as a valuable tool for the implementation of the future international legally binding instrument to tackle marine plastic pollution. And we're looking forward to furthering the collaboration with uh, UNEP. Um, while the uh, spe specific way of collaboration will be further considered, uh, Japan will uh, continue contributing to the sharing of international monitoring data. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so now we are going to have a few minutes for discussion and questions. Um, I believe our first question is going to come from Catherine Mbaisi. Uh, Catherine, are you ready to ask your question? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ellie. And uh, thank you all the panelists for a great discussion and a great uh, uh, learning that I have uh, gotten today. Um, I have um, listened very carefully and um, as a country, uh, maybe I should introduce myself. I'm Catherine Baisi uh, from the National Environment Management Authority in Kenya. And uh, we are very interested in this discussion. And I've just uh, seen or um, learned about the great opportunities that are there uh, when we talk about the digital platform. As a country, we are also faced with this uh, problem of marine litter. And we see this as uh, a platform where we can learn, get a lot of data to help us manage to learn from other um, uh, countries, to get to see what other countries have, have done so that we can also learn. As a country, we have um, developed the National Marine Litter and Management Action Plan 2021-20. Uh, to 2030. And from there, we got a lot of uh, um, issues that we need to address. One of it is the uh, capacity building. And I've seen that um, uh, there is a great opportunity here and for us to partner, to collaborate with others. And we just invite um, our, our friends who can partner in this. Also, we also have a challenge of for uh, data. Um, and I think on this platform, I see a great opportunity where we can also learn how to use data to manage the kind of uh, uh, the sources or the, the, the sources of marine litter. So there is a lot that we have learned and uh, working together with, uh, with, with UNEP, we, we hope to develop the marine um, uh, uh, inventory where we can get the sources of all this uh, marine litter and see how to manage or how to even come up with the um, 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 how to help uh, the upstream uh, management of uh, marine litter. So I just want to see or to see maybe as a country, do we have such uh, opportunities to partner uh, more so that we can help to manage our, our litter and even implement and achieve the aspirations of our uh, national action plan. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine, uh, for sharing those comments. I, would any of the panelists like to uh, respond to Catherine's uh, comments or, or question? Please feel free to unmute yourself and yeah, talk to everyone. Yeah, so one of the phrases you used, Catherine, I think uh, you talked about capacity building. And there's a huge conversation in the Arctic uh, among Inuit about how um, it's actually about capacity sharing, because there's a huge amount of local knowledge on the ground, people going to work, feeding their families, fishing. And it's really hard to get that 
it's seen as a deficit from the scientific community, like a knowledge deficit, therefore there has to be capacity building. But if partnerships meet folks halfway and have ways for recognizing local knowledge that doesn't usually get written down, is usually not in like standard English, you know, is, is kept up in different knowledge keepers' heads and communities, then you can actually have real capacity sharing that uh, bridges some of the scales uh, that these knowledges are happening at. Um, there's a lot of community-based plastics work happening uh, to, to translate that knowledge back and forth um, that I can share with you after if you want. Uh, but it's a very different approach than top-down capacity building. Thank you for sharing that, that response. That's helpful. Any other panelists want to comment on, on Catherine's uh, comments or questions? Uh, uh, Chris, uh, maybe just to, to, to congratulate Catherine, first of all, on, on the development of the National Action Plan. And we think that that those are really going to be critical uh, frameworks that could be used along with regional organizations to resource mobilize, to actually implement solutions on, on the ground. We have done that a lot in the Caribbean region as well, working with countries to develop national action plans, national strategies, and then using those national plans and strategies along with regional ones to identify possible funding and to implement solutions. Because it's all nice to have a plan, but it, it's important to mobilize the resources to actually implement on the ground. Thanks. Thank you. Um, there's if a, I could one, just... Please, go ahead. Yeah, just to complement uh, both of these uh, latest inputs, I think I'd also like to just bring this back to the, the digital platform. So, of course, national action planning is important, but through the digital platform, uh, we're actually enabling more access to data and basing plans on data and actually using the data that's available to monitor the implementation of those plans to see if there's a change in the amount of plastic that's in the environment is also an important tool that we need to consider moving forwards to actually achieve the goals in those plans. Thank you, Elizabeth. Hopefully that's a really helpful comment. Um, I know we just have a moment left um, and would love to hear again uh, from any other panelists. Um, the two themes that I'm noticing coming up in the Q&A, one is around this balance of sort of the breadth of action with local relevance. So how do you come up with very broad plans um, that are actually meaningful on the ground and sort of at the very local level? Um, and, and the other theme that I think has been coming up is this question of sort of tracking plastic once it's already in the environment is helpful. but couldn't we also focus energy and shouldn't we also focus energy on preventing it from getting into the environment in the first place? Um, and how, you know, how might all of this work then help uh, inform not just work to sort of clean up the plastic in the environment, but also really prevent it getting there in the first place. So um, and welcome, maybe one or two last comments from our panelists. Please jump in if you have a thought on either of those topics. Um, I think that uh, having data on the kind of plastic that we have in the environment can actually inform the kind of policy making that we make if we're able to measure that certain types of plastic specifically are uh, wildly uh, present in the environment, then it can inform policies that can actually target specifically plastics or pollution that is an issue on a, on a specific level in a localization or in a sub-regional aspect. So I think that in order to be able to have uh, efficient uh, policies and plans in place that can limit plastic entering the environment in the first place, we need to know what's out there, why it's out there and trace it back to the source because that's how we can ultimately make um, sound, sound decisions for the future. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. And thank you again to all of our panelists. Um, it's been wonderful having you with us. And I, I wish we could continue, uh, but we are at time, unfortunately. So um, I just wanna thank um, everyone who has been part of making this webinar possible, all of the speakers who joined us live, as well as those who shared videos who were not able to be with us live. Um, these were really fantastic uh, presentations and really appreciate all of the questions from the audience and the discussion via the Q&A and the chat as well. Um, I just want to sort of reiterate um, how pleased we are to have had this chance to speak with all of you about GPML's Action Track 5, um, <clears throat> focusing on environmental justice, um, as well as you know, sharing the uh, GPML digital platform phase three release um, and continuing to work around transparency and access to information 
uh, and ensuring that um, all of the data that is being created um, can be shared, can be, you know, can be a focus for collaboration and can really enable, most importantly, you know, accelerating progress on this issue. So um, thank you again to everyone who made this possible, for everyone who joined us. And uh, we are looking forward to um, continuing this work with all of you. Uh, so thank you for joining this event and wishing everyone a wonderful rest of your day. Be well. The recording has stopped.